Okay, I usually script these introductions out, but I'm going to wing it. I mean, I shouldn't be writing an introduction anyway because Justin Pierre needs no introduction. I mean, as lead singer of Motion City Soundtrack, he's charmed us with all kinds of stories of neurosis and uncertainty that, that can be a little too close to comfort or positively hilarious if you've got it all together. And um, I fall into both of those camps. And of course, there's also the dude's hair. Come on. Um, after a couple side projects after Motion City, he's finally made his first Honest to God solo album. It's called In the Drink, and it's 10 tracks of, um, let's call it noise pop goodness, produced by uh, his buddy in Motion City, Josh Kane. And um, it's uh, influenced by Guided by Voices and Van Halen. No, 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 it doesn't sound like those. It's influenced by them in the way that those songs on those records are really, really short. It's like 10, 10 songs and something like that. 29 and a half minutes or something anyway um the whole the whole thing here is that the great thing about justin pierre is that when he answers a question he takes a bullet train straight into four more tangents without seemingly like predicting the questions before i could get them out of my face um we talked about 60s new wave of french film which is a big influence on the cover art as well as the accompanying videos for the record uh him getting fat after motion city breaking up and then getting thin again um his love of feedback uh, that would be guitars, not social media, and uh, his impending tour and whether or not he chats up his old Motion City bandmates. Um, the, thing, the other thing about Pierre is that he's going to dismiss any type of personal importance to the scene or music in general. You know, he's just he's just doing what he likes to do. But really, there hasn't been anybody in this community who's really articulated uncertainty, neurosis, anxiety, whatever whatever psychic maladies are out there, and, and do it in a way that's like thoughtful, witty, and resonant. Um, and the drink comes out October 12th. He's going on tour soon afterward. Uh, but and, uh, and it would be really stupid if I didn't make this corny, corny cliche. But uh, right now, if you listen to the record, uh, in Justin Pierre's world, everything is all right. In the drink. Mm. Does anybody under 50 even use that phrase anymore? And what does it represent in Justin Pierre world? Uh, like most things that I do or that I've figured, like, I've kind of stumbled upon this idea and I don't know when it started happening, but, um, I tried to put together words in such a way that you can, um, find different meanings, you know, whatever it means to you. So, so I was thinking about this, forget, like I've been going on a lot of bike rides trying to get in shape. Uh, and, and then my mind wanders. And I was actually thinking about this recently that, um, it's, it's really, t okay. I'm, I, again, let me just start by saying I'm going to wander during this conversation and I may never come back. So you might have to direct me a bit more, but, uh, I, I will put okay. I will get my psychic yeah. fishing rod and hook okay. you in the mouth. <laughs> That's what I need. I need, I need that. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess. Uh, there's the obvious, you know, uh, allusion to alcohol, uh, but also water, um, and, and just, you know, sort of anything that, you know, any kind of muck you get stuck in, um, I guess, I guess to, to, to keep it real simple. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, but yeah, in, in terms of like writing stuff, I, I, I've stumbled upon this idea of just putting things together in a way that makes sense to me. Like as long as I can make sense of it and decipher it, I'm good. But then I also like to leave it a little open-ended so that I could see maybe two, three or four, if I'm lucky, like story branches that kind of go out that different people could latch onto and, and make it their own. And then of course, people are going to come up with ridiculous ideas that I never even thought of, which is great. Um, so that's kind of what I've been trying to do over the last decade or so. I've been fine tuning that a bit more. Uh, Cause I think when I started writing stuff, it was very literal. Like I'm washing the dishes. Um, <laughs> I don't know. The video is pretty great too. It's where you're going for Jean-Luc Godard's weekend meets Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, they, well, I, I can't even like, this is, this is crazy. This is the fun part where uh, no offense to Motion City, but with that band, you have five people with completely different ideas that can never agree on anything. And there was a lot of, like, what I ran into was, hey, guys, I have this crazy idea. We just need $400,000. And they're like, yeah, of course, we can't do that. 
So, so, um, so, so now with not really having to like anyone to sort of keep me in check, um, I don't have $400,000 to make cool shit. I've got like $10, but I, I, I wanted to make something that was, um, like a, a fully encased in an idea. And, and with MCS, a lot of times we would have these grand ideas and then for, for one reason or another, they would slowly have to change over time and then we'd run out of time and then we kind of mishmash it together at the last minute. And then it would be kind of what we wanted, but it would also not be kind of what we wanted. And then everybody was kind of happy and, and, and I can't speak for anyone else, but that's kind of how I felt. Um, and, and some ideas were better than others. And so with this, I kind of set out like, okay, here are the parameters and this is what I want to do. Uh, I want, you know, I want to have this whole French new wave theme with all of the imagery involved in this record, whether it's the artwork or the photos I'm taking or, um, the, you know, videos, movies we're making. And, and I kind of mixed this, like, uh, I think it was like late fifties to late sixties, French new wave with the sort of late. 80s to early 90s like black and white punk rock aesthetic and I, and there's something in that and and that was like i'm not very good at explaining myself i tend to have more ethereal ideas and so uh, i find people that can understand and decipher what i'm saying and i throw these ideas at them and then they show me what i'm talking about and if it resonates, I'm like, ooh, that's it. Let's 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 go in that direction. And so whether So essentially you need a you need a dream interpreter, I guess. Yeah, kind of. Cause I'm not I'm very you know and I like whatever you think of David Lynch, I feel like um when I was younger, I thought he was a, a genius and he spoke in these weird codes. But I think as I got older, I just sort of realized that he doesn't give a shit whether he sounds like a, like a lunatic or not. And he's just saying without a filter, the ideas, you know, like a duck can't have two eyes on one side of its head or else it wouldn't be a duck, you know, whatever that means. But so I'm saying that I feel like I understand that a little bit more as I'm getting older that like, here's the idea. It's not fully understood by me even, but I know there's something here. Let's investigate. And that's kind of more what what it's been like recently. And so with Jason at Epitaph, I kind of gave him some imagery to work with and some, uh, uh, I think there were posters for French New Wave films. And then kind of mentioned like this aesthetic, uh, like the late 80s black and white punk rock uh, f photographs that I liked. And then he kind of put together something, uh, like a few things and then sent it to me. And I was like, oh, that's the one. Um, and then like Dan Monick took photos for me and he automatically already does this sort of thing. I don't know that he would call it that, but, and that was a lot of fun. And we, and we just shot, like, I think we took a day. Yeah. Was, was it a day? I think it was one day and we just shot all around Minneapolis. Uh, and it was very hot, and very sweaty, but he, and he, he was the drummer of Lifter Puller. I don't know if you remember them. Um, yeah. And he's just a fantastic photographer and just a rad dude. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And, and then with Shane, I've been working with Shane, Shane, Shane Nelson directed the music video and he and I have been best buds since uh, I met him. I think he was just a PA on the Future Freaks Me Out music video. And he actually knew my sister. And, and then we kind of became friends and just, you know, made a bunch of movies, short films together and music videos and things. And he directed the Motion City music video for A Lifeless Ordinary and uh, all the Farewell Continental videos that I've ever done and okay. a bunch of things that no one's ever seen. But <laughs> luckily we have a new, we have a new, mu and I don't know when this is coming out, but uh, I think, what is, what is the date? August 22nd, uh, a, a music video for a song called I Don't Know Why She Ran Away is coming out and we utilize a lot of things that nobody's seen that we've shot over the years in that video. Oh, okay. So. I don't know if I answered your question, but those are some thoughts. Gotcha. Who was the femme fatale on the bridge with you? You're going about to jump over the bridge with. Um, yeah, Melissa Pock. And she, she, I think we just did like an open call to just see if anybody was interested. And she, I guess, I didn't want to get like too into detail about everything because all the, 
all these videos. I'm basically making a music video for every song. Um, everybody keeps saying Beyonce, but I kind of respond with shitty Beyonce. But you know, let's be honest. <laughs> Anything that's not Beyonce is basically shitty Beyonce. Okay. So, uh, I, and and when I say music video, it's like our, our, our budget is tiny. And when I told Epitaph, hey, can I just take this money for this one video you want to give me and make 10? And they're like, really? Do you think that's a good idea? Can you actually do that? And I said yes, but I didn't know. Um, and so I think there's like four music videos, four or five music videos that have a lot, most of the money went into them. And then the other five or six are, are kind of... Um, they're kind of just like elevated lyric videos without the lyrics in them, you know, just kind of simple sort of, uh, Oh, what, uh, installations, if you will. Installations. But yeah. Installations. Episodes. Yeah. Episodes, but they're all related. And I guess okay. the point being that Melissa plays a version of my wife because I couldn't get my wife, you know, we have a kid. And so the two of us can never be, a, you know, doing something in this vein without hiring a, a babysitter or something. And with music videos, you never, there's no time, at least the way that we do them. It's like, you, it may say that we'll finish by 10, but we may not finish until 2 a.m. Um, sure. So I just cast someone uh, as a, a version of my wife. And then, but my wife does make an appearance in at least one of these videos, maybe a couple, I'm not sure. But yeah. Are there, are there certain things, kinds of things that you hadn't thought about when deciding to embark on a solo career, like everything from recording the record to making the record to, to, to making the videos to everything else about it, where there are kind of things that you definitely, oh, we, we have to worry about that. Kind of oh, yeah, everything. I didn't, I didn't really, like even the word solo career, like I get it, but I, I didn't think about it. And it sounds gross to me, kind of like the word art sounded gross to me or musician when I first started. Like it took me, I think by the time maybe my dinosaur life came out, the, at that point, that was when I started telling people I was a musician. Uh, and I think, you know, like, I, I don't know, it just takes me a very long time to figure things out. So if I'm fortunate enough to make more than one record, I think by record three or four, I'll say solo career without cringing. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it sounds just as gross to me as it probably does to a lot of other people. But I, I didn't intend to do this. I mean, I, 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 like when Motion City played our last show in Chicago, it was a mixture of, like it was really exciting, emotional, like it was sad, it was beautiful. It was, it was a great ending. Like it felt really good, that show. And, and I, I, but I also felt a lot of relief <clears throat> and I think we all did. We were just kind of, I think, going, like, we, it was like we were on a train heading somewhere, and it was, like, slowing down, and it was slow enough for us to all be able to just, like, get off, and we were like, maybe we should just get off. And, like, yeah, I don't know. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know if that was a good analogy. But we all kind of wanted to focus on other things, mainly family stuff and just like being around and having like being there for events like birthdays and Halloween and Christmas and, and all that shit. And, you know, seeing the effects that touring constantly had on Josh's, you know, relationship and just like, you know, he told me these things about his kid would, you know, FaceTime and be like, why are you gone? Why aren't you here? You know? And I just, I was like, Oh my God, I'm, that's going to be me. And so, you know, I, I tried to use that and learn from that. And I think we all reached a point where we just had to kind of back away from touring. And so as soon as that happened, like I was great. I just ate pizza and ice cream every day and I hung out with my kid and it was super fun. And I gained like 25 pounds. And then I was just, you know, she what's actually, your favorite, like, what's your favorite Ben and Jerry's flavor? I don't, I don't really, I don't really get into that. You know, I got, there was that Stephen Colbert's Americone dream. Okay. I think I, I, I got into that a little bit, but it was mostly, um, I'm going to mess this up. Irish Moxie is the kind of ice cream and I get it from Pizza Luce here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I think Izzy's, maybe that's the name of the company. Crap. Anyway. Oof. I was just wondering what the, yeah. where, where the 25 pounds came from. Oh, pizza and ice cream and just being a total pile of garbage. 
um, yeah, I just, I just ate and didn't move. Like when I'm on tour, I usually lose 20 pounds. My wife talks, this is like weird. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about weight stuff, but I gain and lose pounds very quickly depending on what I'm doing. So if I'm playing a show, like I would, like I, I, I would lose like 20 pounds every time I go on tour just from playing shows and doing nothing else. Um, and so by not doing that, I did, I literally didn't exercise at all. Um, and yeah, and I think one of my nieces or nephews referred to me as fat Santa, uh, on Halloween, like not, not just Santa, but like fat, fat Panda. No, fat Santa. Fat Santa. Yeah. Not just Santa, but fat Santa, like specifically. And that was when I was like, Oh shit, I should probably do something about this. So like, I think starting last, like in the new year sometime, I just started working out like crazy. And, um, I think I'm down about 35 pounds. So I'm actually in better shape than I was before MCS ended. Uh, well, you no. were supposed to, you said you were going to be an accountant or, or a stay at home dad, right? I mean, post MCS. Well, so I, I guess. We'll yeah, just... I kind of joked. I mean, I, 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 I had sort of a mental crisis, I think, on one of the last tours. And I was like, what am I going to do with my life? Like, I, I have no skills. Like, I'm not, I did not graduate from college. I, I spent five years at a two year community college and still have nothing to show for it. I don't know how that happened. Uh, and, and so I'm like, what do I like? Like, I love math. I love math. Math is easy. Numbers easy. I love it. It's so simple. It makes sense to me. Um, and then I started looking up into accounting and, and everything that you needed to do. And then I was like, Oh shit, this whole like bar exam stuff looks really difficult. <laughs> and then my wife was like, yeah, that would not, you would lose your mind. Uh, so she kind of talked me out of, out of that idea, but yeah, it's just like trying to redefine your life at any age. But for me, you know, being in my forties, that was terrifying, but being in my fifties would be even scarier. So it's like, what do I do? I don't know how to do anything else. I'm just going to take whatever free time I have and just go into, I've got like a little room in the basement that I, you know, work in and I just started writing and compiling and I would just with whatever free time I had, just start writing tunes. And then, and then I thought, Oh, here's some, here's some music. This doesn't suck. Does this suck? I don't know. And then I contacted Josh Kane and I thought, Hey, do you want to listen to this and tell me if this sucks? And, and, and then so he did, he's like, no, this doesn't suck. Uh, and then I asked him, it's like, Hey, can you produce this for me? And I used air quotes cause I, I didn't have any money. So he, he came at a discount rate and, um, but he worked his ass off and we slowly just made this, I think, was it 2017 or six? I, God, I get so confused. 2017 from March to October, I think is how long it took us. But some days we, we wouldn't even work like some weeks. And then some days we'd work eight hours. Some days we'd work like an hour and a half. Some days we get a phone call like, oh, kid needs to get picked up. Something happened at school or like, oh, there's an emergency. And so we just kind of piece this thing together over time without, I didn't really have a plan. I just wanted to make, see if see if i could write something uh write all the parts instead of just the guitar part and the vocal part and then record it but uh, like technology wise like, i don't know anything about like i'm just not smart in that way to know how to physically record with the computer and then also how like what mics to use and all that stuff i just don't understand it whereas josh is really good with that and so it was great to work with him in that capacity um where you know we have that shorthand and we both are into the same things and he'll come at something uh with a different idea and go oh what if you do this here instead or like oh no 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 keep that that's cool it doesn't make sense it's great and and oftentimes you know i kind of had this idea that i wanted to you know make something that to me represented the music i i was digging in the early 90s when i was a you know teenager and so I guess I've always attempted to do that, but, but now more so since there's not four other people with their, um, influences involved and, uh, and in doing this, Josh even, I think pushed me further into that direction because he knows what I like. And that, that was really great to have that. It was a different kind of Josh. Whereas I think before when we were writing, we, we would each like not fist fight, but we'd fight for what we want to do. And at the end, we'd come to some sort of agreement, you know, somebody would win or we would both, you know, win. Uh, and then, and then now it was kind of like, I got to make the final decision, but he would throw ideas at me to see what, what I dug or what I didn't dig. 
Sorry, am I rambling? I feel like I'm just kind of... No, you like hit like four different things I was going to ask you specific oh, questions good. about. So Sorry, let me, I just, let me, let me yeah. let's, let's go okay. towards the album. Okay. Right. We're talking about the making of the album. Yeah. The longest song clocks in at four and a half minutes. That's, uh, that's the song <laughs> on the wire. Yeah. And uh, most of the tracks are slightly over two minutes, probably in the two and a half range. Mm -hmm. um, the people tell you the hit single is three and a half minutes these days, uh, probably even three, but even today's ADD adult activity why not uh why the brevity why why so many short songs i can't write songs <laughs> uh <laughs> that's like i basically like like i i'm a big fan of guided by voices and maybe that's because uh like you know or pavement the early pavement uh stuff like i love all the pavement but specifically the early songs where you've got one part and then you just kind of change the melody a little bit now you got a chorus um but that kind of th it's like i've got a b a b a b and then it's done i can't write a fucking bridge to save my life and it, it's just really like it's really difficult i don't know how drums work I, I like i literally do not know how drums work so some of these songs were me just programming with you know logic like oh let's do a kick here and a snare here and let's do this and uh, oh wait there's no symbols in this is that important and and then I'd show it to, you know, Josh and the drummer, David Jarnstrom, and they both scratch their heads and go, this makes no sense. Like no drummer would, would play this, but it's kind of cool. Let me see how I can do this. And David would be like, okay, I think I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And especially like on, I'm a liar. There's no, he's like, you don't have anything on the one. And I'm like, oh really? What does that mean? And so it's really weird playing that song with the drummer. Like it sounds fine to me, but actually playing it with him was really strange. And, and now I know what he, he meant. <laughs> Um, sorry, I forgot what the original question was, but no, that's okay. You answered uh, it. You're talking about talking, talking about the brevity okay. of the tracks. Um, oh yeah. And just that, I, I think the brevity comes from not really knowing how to put together a song. Cause I've always been more of a part writer, um, where I've got like, oh, here's this part in this melody. What is this? And then the band would be, you know, motion city would be like, Ooh, that sounds like a, like a verse or that sounds like a chorus. Okay. And then somebody else would come in and go, hey, what if we marry these two parts? So not having that and it all relying on me, it's it's it was super difficult. I think, you know, and I just put together the songs as I heard them and they all clocked in at like two minutes. So not bad. you also um, you also said yeah. you, you also talk about, you know, the 90s, the stuff that you were like into in the 90s and all that stuff. And uh, I've noticed there's a lot, whole lot of feedback action here, like Sooner and mm. Moonbeam and oh, man. Angry Yuki and um, that kind of further distances you from Motion City. It's as if you almost on on Panic Stations, the last record. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like it was something that you wanted to explore. When I mean you, I mean the entire band. But like you're doing it here, mm -hmm. and it's a textural thing that adds a great sense of energy to it. And I'm just kind of wondering if that's. But you kind of answered that, saying that you, I guess you're taking cues from your '90s faves. Yeah, and Are you I mean, a shoegazer it, guy. If, it, Yes, I, I don't know if I was any one thing, but I loved a lot of different stuff. Like I, I'd say that my favorite band in that vein would be Swerve Driver for sure. That's what I was thinking. And I don't know, yeah. And that, I mean, like, if you're familiar with any of these bands, and I've been uh, side note, I've been putting up these mixes every like Monday of like each each uh, year, so like 1990, and I put like a mix. I call them mixtapes, but they're basically just playlists up on like Spotify and Apple Music and youtube or whatever and they're about i think they're like 90 minutes worth of music so 45 minutes per side and, and and if you're familiar with any of these bands you you'll you'll hear any of these songs and go oh that's just ripped from that band or that band because i'm not very good at hiding that but uh you know i i, I love that tom waits quote that i always use and bastardize uh, something about uh, all anyone does is imitate their favorite artists badly uh and that i definitely do that um, but I would say Swerve Driver is probably my favorite and Sooner, I think has Sooner and man, that like Moonbeams, uh, Mark McCluskey mixed this record and holy fuck, did he like with the feedback stuff, he is a, I mean, he, he's great at everything, but the feedback stuff, he really made that sound good. And I have to give a shout out to him for, for why that sounds so good. Um, but Josh, especially in Sooner, he, we, I did these things we called whale sounds. Um, and my friend Tommy Rabine, who's actually going to be playing guitar, he's in Farewell Continental and he works for Zvex Effects. I don't know if you know that company. Make oh, yeah. great, great shit. Uh, Plus factory and yeah, distortion. Yeah. Sure. And Tommy, and Tommy makes his own pedals. Amazing, yeah. amazing stuff. 
Yeah. One of my favorite is the Fuzz Factory played direct. Just it's just the gnarliest shit. I think there's a song called Alcohol Eyes that was like a B-side on Go by Motion City that has that on there. And I think the solo in um on this album, uh was it yeah, I don't know why she ran away. I think that's I think we did two solos and then we with two different sounds and married them together. But sorry, I was off on a tangent. What was I saying? Swerve Driver. Let's, let's just say Swerve Driver. Also, there's a guy here named Ed Ackerson. He produced uh, Go and I, and everything Farewell Continental has ever done. Um, and he's like my hero. And then I also like befriended him. So it's like a weird thing to grow up listening to somebody because his band Polera was amazing. Oh, okay. And I think, I think Polera and Swerve Driver were a big influence on the song Sooner. Um, but yeah, he's a master of, of feedback and, and sound. I thought for a second there was supposed to be a nod to My Bloody Valentine because they have a song called Sing. Oh, didn't think about uh, Yeah, of course. Exactly. That's what it was. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, I, I love My Bloody Valentine, but I, I can't do it. You know, like, like I, I would say, like, I, I, I feel like there's, there's aspects of Swerve Driver that I could pull off. But I will say that I saw them when they put out their first of their recent records here in Minneapolis at the Turf Club. And it is probably the best sounding show I've ever seen. And I don't know how four people made it sound so good. Like they weren't playing with tracks and they, it sounded like the record. It was so good. And those records have like thousands of guitars on them. Um, anyway. Their shows have been pretty consistent. I haven't seen them play a bad show. So it's pretty. Yeah. It's, it's, I never got to see to them. To. Yeah. And I never got to see them in the nineties. So it was really cool to get to see them, you know, like a few years ago. If um, if Motion City was Justin's anxiety and neurosis in full bloom, <laughs> what is in the drink? I mean, you're not really middle aged crazy yet. You know what I mean? You're still kind of young for that. But I think I might. I think I might have been middle aged crazy when I was in my twenties, and now I'm actually. Um, I don't know. Like I feel like I have an excitement for life that I didn't. Have. I'm, I'm all like jumbled up and and like miss it's all mixed up Benjamin Buttoning type things or something. uh yes and no but I, I yeah i mean my 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 body's went to shit but my you know my uh heart and my soul and you know my 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 brain i don't know about but you know i i i feel excited about making art these days in a way that i i i just wasn't there i like i wasn't there when i was there you know like growing up i think and it's kind of ironic. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but that now that I'm, I'm past a certain point, I'm excited about the possibilities of it all. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Uh, it's hard to explain. Well, I mean, because you're in charge of your own ship, I mean, just everything, everything is different. You know? Yeah. I guess there's like, I, I don't give a fuck in a way. It's just like, I'm going to make, some stuff and I, I'm sure that there are people out there that are going to dig it and there are a lot of people that are going to hate it and um, you know I at least have going for me the fact that there's going to be a group of people that check this out because they want to see how how good or shitty it is compared to what I've done before um, so there's that <laughs> I mean, let, let's let's talk about. It. I mean, you're uh, you're always. There's, there, we've spoken many times before, and the one quote that we kind of get back to is, "There's a certain point in your life, whatever you were listening to in your late teens, early twenties, mm. and just right right to your, about your mid twenties, your kind of kind of imprints itself." Yeah. On. And after I, that, everything else is kind of oh, it's kind of cool, but it doesn't really doesn't hit you the same, same way. Type of resonance. So, you know, you could listen to. Uh, you could listen to any really cool bands happening right now, but it's never going to be as good as Jawbox or Sword Sword Driver. But I will say that what's really interesting, or what I found, or maybe it's only because I've been paying attention. Well, okay, gosh, there's two things I'd love to talk about right now. So let me not forget. One has to do with the relationship between the band or the musician and the listener. So don't let me forget that. And then the other has to do about um, music now. And I will say that. Uh, in talking with, in, in, in particular, having conversations with with Ed Ackerson and talking about all the bands that I love from the '90s, and he's like friends with all these guys. 
you know, I would say, oh, I, I love this band. And then he'd, he'd say something like, oh, they were just totally trying to be the kinks or whoever, you know, and then like, oh, what about this band? It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. They totally were influenced by this band. And so it seemed like all the bands in the 90s wanted to be bands from like the 60s or the 70s. And then now what's really cool is that all of these bands that I'm, I'm, I'm finding out right now are doing like the 90s, but doing it in their own way and way better than I can. And it's fucking frustrating, but it's so cool. Like one of my new new favorite finds is a band called Charlie Bliss. I don't know if you've heard them, but holy shit. Uh, I'm, I'm just in love with this band. And like that first um, Speedy Ortiz record, uh, I love that that Major Arcana uh, reminded me of like a combination of Nirvana meets Pavement and Liz Fair in a weird way. Um, and then the um, uh, uh, the Joy Formidable is another band that's just like bonkers. Like it sounds like the '90s, but I can't I can't place the band. You know what I mean? Like it's they're doing their own thing, which is really neat. Um, so I'm actually really excited about some of the music I'm hearing now because I think those people are, are are trying to get to that that whatever that was about the 90s that you know the dream of the 90s if you will dream of the 90s uh, no, we, i don't yeah. know we were all we we're all nihilistic gen x types i really can't comment on that it's, so. yeah well i i feel like yeah there's a lot of like aside from the music yeah i don't because aside from the music i feel like all the thing that i hear about the people that were playing the music was that that was a horrible time <laughs> in the world of just like not nothing made any sense. I don't know. It's weird because I was a teenager, so uh, I think I'm I think I'm on the bottom end of the Gen X spectrum. Um, but I don't remember any of the garbage that was going on or political stuff or any of that. All I remember was just amazing music happening. That's what I like to remember as well. Yeah. The um trying to think of how to articulate this. Do you feel like there is a weird Peter Pan syndrome that's forced on bands in the community that Motion City came up through? Like you're supposed to release, commit this to memory too, or me too am the movie. And is it, it's the only solution almost to kind of break up and make it a clean slate and blow it off and start over again? I mean, that probably makes sense, but I, I don't, you know, I think I do remember having like pressure, whether it was real or imaginary, I think around the time we made Even If It Kills Me. And I can kind of, I, I've kind of talked about this before, but I can kind of pinpoint that like the things that I w was worried about and obsessed with. I was so focused on that. I forgot other things. And so if I go back to the record, like, I feel like I, I like all the records, but I wish I would have maybe screamed a little more on Even If It Kills Me. I was so concerned about like pulling it off live that I sang really pretty on the whole thing. Um, that's something. And then on My Dinosaur Life, we kind of went the opposite way. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to scream like crazy. And and I kind of used all these things that I discovered uh, making uh, FC, Farewell Continental music. And I kind of put them into that. Like get, get, Guitar wise, I think My Dinosaur Life is probably my favorite record. But I think that also has to do with um, uh, 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 mixing and I'm blanking on his name right now. And I feel horrible, uh, but he makes like Sonic Youth records. Um, crap. If only there were a device that I could use to look up this information. <laughs> um, I'm going to show. I'm hard bumming right now. Okay. Hard bumming right now. That should be the next name of the next name. Hard bumming right now. <laughs> oh, uh, Andy Wallace. That's it. Oh, okay. Andy Wallace. Yeah. Um, but that I would say that My Dinosaur is probably one of my favorite uh, Motion City records in terms of guitar sounds because that's kind of the stuff that I, I I wanted to do. And I feel like I feel like I can see some connection between this record and that in terms of all the like feedback and noisy weird guitar stuff. Um, obviously our budget was not nearly as much as that one was. Um, but yeah, sorry, you asked me a question. Uh, oh yeah, that kind of ties into something like somebody said something on Twitter. I've been sort of a madman and responding to every single person. I I'd say I've got a 98% response rate, uh, but I also have a lot of time on my hands. And, <laughs> and, and somebody said something about like, 
yeah, why is it that every band by their third or fourth record starts sounding like shit? I'm paraphrasing here. Um, and then like, they don't have any good songs. Uh, and, and it's fu- like, one, I love engaging in like negative stuff, not like, and not in like a fuck you kind of way, but sort of a like, yeah, you got me. That's great. Let's talk about this. Or just, you know, I think a lot of people put stuff out there and don't expect responses. Um, but what is interesting is that I feel like, and I've thought this for a while, and I'm not saying this person is wrong, because like maybe every record we put out since the third one is garbage. Uh, but also, I, I think that people seem to think that they don't change in any way, shape or form, and that it's just everything around them that changes. And what I've discovered, what I think, I mean, it makes sense to me is that like, as you grow as a human being, you start branching off in one direction. And if the band that you're listening to or the musician that you're listening to starts branching off in another direction, of course, you're not going to be connecting, you know, further down the road. And it's very rare that a band and a a listener or a musician and a listener grow in the same direction because take a band like low for instance i got into them i think around uh things we lost in the fire and i tried to go backwards and i kind of liked a few songs but i wasn't really into it as much but then from that point on like if you look at like every record is it starts getting bonkers and like when they started working with dave fridman and drums and guns holy shit but somehow i grew in the exact same way as they did and it was like we were on the same path, you know? So they didn't lose me ever. Or like you take someone like like the Afghan Wigs to the Twilight Singers, to Greg Dooley's solo record, to back to the Afghan Wigs. And like, I was right there with it. You know, I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't find that thing that other people find where they're like, ah, oh, this record sucks. It's not this other record. I have felt that way about other bands, but I think that that doesn't necessarily, it's not, <laughs> I'd say it both is and isn't the band's fault, but it also, I guess the point I want to make is that I think the listener also has to understand that they probably aren't exactly the same person they were 10 years ago to some degree. I don't know. That just makes sense to me. And I hope that doesn't come off as like a shitty thing. Like, I'm not trying to be like shitty, like, fuck you. But it's more just like, I think that that makes sense on a scientific level. I don't think you're being negative. I think you're just addressing human nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are records that I thought were really great when I bought them. Like I went back and pulled out a bunch the other day and I went, this is crap. Why am I, why am I putting this in my house? No, no, this has to go. Yeah. Likewise, I want to also say that my favorite motion city record is go. Okay. There's so much stuff on that. I think is just perfect. My favorite motion city song is box elder. Oh, wow. The, the, the weird Josh's weird circus guitar part. Yeah. That's, that's got a cool, That's got a cool ending. I feel like that. That was a. That's a weird song. Like I love that song, but it is weird. Um, yeah, I would have to agree that. Uh, like Jonah Bayer made me do this horrible thing where I had to rate the albums, and it oh, was yeah. like the worst experience of my life. But, but I like Jonah, so it was fine. But uh, I, I, I would have to say that Go is probably one of my favorite records lyrically. Uh, there's a lot of darkness. So like what's what's weird is like sober darkness is different than drunken darkness. And there was a lot of sober darkness going on at that point in my life. And yeah. And I think, I don't know. I feel like, I think like one of the first songs I sang was, um, uh, happy anniversary. And I think I'm not a hundred percent, but I think Matt said it made him cry. Uh, when I was tracking it, which is, you know, it's kind of like when you're shooting a movie or a scene or something and like the camera person starts crying. Um, so that, that, that felt pretty good. But yeah, I dig, I dig the lyrics on that record a lot. Well, I like the lyrics on this record. There's like these really, these, just these really great killing one liners given, mm. given your history. I don't know where I'm going, <laughs> but I'm glad it's all over. Mm. I'm just glad that it's done. Uh, yeah. let's see the one. I used to, and what we've just been talking about, I used to feel things, then I got older, <laughs> over the way. Yeah, you know I what that. I mean? So it's like, you're doing the interview. You really don't need to do the interview. You should just, you should just talk into a machine and just make that. <laughs> What's the biggest takeaway listeners should glean from in the drink? Oof. I don't know if like, you know? I, I, part of this is tough for me. Cause like, I don't, I didn't. I don't ever really have a plan with anything I do. I just sort of make stuff. And I think I always get worried when I have to talk about things because I don't, 
I don't really have the uh, confidence, I think, to feel like I, I like I come across I, like this, whatever this is. Do you is. overthink things or are you just afraid of saying the wrong thing? Uh, I'd say both, but definitely overthink. Like in terms of this, what's happening here, overthink things. Uh, in my life in relation to like, you know, being married, it's I don't want to say the wrong thing. But uh, I, yeah, I think it's just that I, all I wanted to do was to see if I could write a record by myself. And then I did. And then I thought, oh, hey, let's see if I can record this. How much is that going to cost? How much money am I willing to just set on fire and throw in the garbage? Okay, cool. I can deal with that. Um, now let's see. Oh, we made a record. Is it any good? Shit, doesn't sound bad. Let's see if I can sell it. And then, holy shit, Epitaph wants to put this out. Awesome. Let's do that. And so now here I am. So that that's kind of just how it went. And it wasn't really intended. Like, I didn't know what I was going to do ever. So I think I'm kind of following this through to see where it ends. And I guess it ends after December 9th, because I go on tour, I think to November 1st, I do two legs, East Coast and West Coast. And I got, you know, and part of like, I, I don't want to be away for a long time. So I, I talked with my wife and I just sort of thought in myself, you know, thought to myself, like, what's an amount of time that I'm willing to, to be away from my wife and my kid. And I figured a month, a year is good. So I'm going to try this and see what happens. And if, if the response is good, where I can, you know, make a living off of this, maybe I'll readdress that. But I think for now, this is just as is like a, an art experiment, you know, and when, you know, my original goal was, let's see if I can make art for a living. And if I can do that and, you know, pay the mortgage and get groceries and stuff, then that would be great. And if I can't do that, let's see if I can make art that will self, you know, su sustain itself and I'll get another job and I'll do that for a living, but I'll make art on the side. And then if I can't do that, maybe every 10 years I'll put out a record and I'll just be a dad. So that, that's like, you know, kind of what I was looking at and I'm, I'm aiming for that higher tier, but if I fall anywhere along that line, I'll be okay, you know, with, you know, emotionally and with myself. Um, so I didn't answer your question <laughs> or maybe I did, but that is, so I guess it's like, I haven't thought about other people. I hope that's not horrible to say, but I just kind of, I just kind of made some shit and it was what I was thinking about and feeling. I was referencing other parts of my life and, you know, current events uh, things of that ilk. And I, I just want people to, I guess, dig in and see what it means for them and decipher it how they will and enjoy the shit out of it. Uh, or if you hate it, you know, keep it yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dude, there's this yeah. thing called social media. Check it out. There's uh, somebody who is, somebody, somebody told me today, uh, somebody on Twitter was calling you out for having that same hairstyle. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. And you yeah, responded I put, I, to him. I forget you. You responded to him something pithy. I, I think they said they said they said something like, uh, "Wondering if that guy from Motion City soundtrack still has that heinous, uh, blah 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 haircut." And then I just responded, "He does." <laughs> uh, that's fair that's, enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, and don't change that. That's if you like were to funny. get one of those, if you were to like, like get the manicured beard and get the gentleman's haircut where everything is shaved except for like reverse like monk tonsure, you know what I mean? If you were to do that, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd bum out severely. I would, well, I would seriously you know, there bum is out a, severely. There is a thing called uh, time that happens. And so the hair will go away. We don't know when. We don't know how. But it will disappear. And you just keep, and on, I'm a, keep on on. Until yeah, then. I'll just do whatever happens, you know, I, I like the, you know, I, I can't speak for who, who I'm going to be 10, 20 years from now, or how I will think, but as my, my whole thing has been to just let, let, let time happen to you. Um, and so I hope that I can continue to do that. Uh, the only, the only, the only thing I, I try to change are just like the exercise habits as I have a three-year-old that I can't play with 
at 100%. And so I, in order to do that, I need to get in better shape so I can throw her around and run around without like wheezing and coughing. Understood. Letting time happen to you. Yeah. Very nice. Um, <laughs> who's, who's in your backing band this fall? Well, I'm still waiting on a reply. Let me just check my phone real quick because I am, yeah, nope, not yet. Uh, I want to, I don't even know what to, I kind of want, I've been really enjoying the social media as of late and just trying to put lots of fun shit out there for people to like or, or hate. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of introduce the band at some point on that, but uh, right now the band is David Jarnstrom who played drums on the record. So he knows the tunes and he is in BNLX with Ed Ackerson and, and Ed's wife, Ashley Ackerson. Uh, and he also, I think, I don't know if you remember the band Gratitude, uh, Jonah from, yeah, uh, he was in that band and then a band Attention, he's in a ton of bands. There's like a new band he's in here called Rad, Rad Owl, not Red Owl, but Rad Owl. Um, anyway, so he's playing drums, Tommy Rabine from Farewell Continental, and he's got his own project called International Karate and a new project that's really rad called Robo Sapien. Uh, <laughs> you should check out Robo Sapien. It's like, it's like fucked up. D, uh, Devo, if that makes any sense. It's like shitty I'm Devo. With it. But I, I mean that in the nicest way. I mean that in the nicest way. Uh, um, Cause I love like he, he records everything himself and he actually, uh, I don't, well, we're working on this project. I want to do this thing in between each, I've got a 10 year plan here. Okay. And I wanted to put out a record a year. And then in between each of those records, I wanted to put out an EP and those EPs I was going to call, um, and this is Tommy's name that he let me use. It's called um, Open Mic at the Lo-Fi. And, and so I've got these EPs and I recorded an EP with him producing and it's fucking great. It's, it's like, basically think of like guided, like songs that Guided by Voices wouldn't even put on a record in like 1993. Like that, that's, that, that's how great they sound. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, Tommy, Tommy's going to be playing guitars, but his main job is like all the feedback and all the noise and all the, the loops and like, he's, 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 he's going to shoegaze it up. Gotcha. Um, and then a woman from here named Lydia Liza, who I did not know, uh, Steph, uh, POS, he, he recommended her, uh, and she's going to play guitar and sing, do the harmonies. And then I have a bass player that I'm fingers crossed. Uh, the only problem is she's in Chicago. And so I have to use all of my frequent flyer maps to get her out here for rehearsals and for the tour. But, um, but so I'm waiting to hear back before I, I say who that is. Uh, but that's okay. going to be the band. But don't pull the trigger. On that. Yeah. But the, the, uh, the goal is to try, I, we're not going to like hurt you. Like you, you'd get hurt when you go see like Jay Mascus, you know, play guitar, but, and we're not going to have like a, a cave of amps or anything, but the idea is to be very guitar very guitar focused uh, on this on this run and kind of you know blow your ears up a bit. So we'll see if that if we are able to do that. Is it going to be weird playing gigs without your usual gang? Yes, I've already had uh, I've already had some rehearsals, and it was um, yeah, and I I I learned a lot because uh, I think with that group of guys, like if if Motion City got together tomorrow to play a show. We could probably pull it off, and and it you know, I, I think that we just like playing so long with the same people, you just kind of know each other, and you just kind of fall into that that thing. So even at our worst, we would probably be pretty good. Uh, whereas this is like I got to get used to a whole new thing, and like not like yeah, it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be interesting. It's kind of like um, yeah, how do I how do I describe it? Um, it's kind of like playing basement shows, but at big venues, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of terrible. I mean, like I'm terrified, but I'm also really excited. And I also, the part of me that gives zero fucks is so excited to just make noise. And I, I just, I really want people to have fun. I really want people to come and, you know, get excited. And, you know, for the, um, because these songs only clock in at two minutes, per, uh, I have to figure out how to like extend at least an hour to an hour and 15 minutes of music, right? That's like what, what a ticket is worth these days. 
at least because uh, I don't want to get up there and like pull a Jesus Mary chain, play three songs and blow up the speakers and then leave. Uh, uh, I want to, you know, give people their money's worth. So I'm going to be filling in the gaps with uh, some Farewell Continental songs because Tom is going to be there. Uh, I've got this project with Andrew Reiner from uh, Game Informer magazine. He's the executive editor of that magazine. And we started this project that basically writes songs based in the world of certain video games. And we've only released two, but we've got about five or six. We're just kind of holding on to them. Um, but I'll probably play one of those songs. We'll do a few covers. And then I'm I'm going to do some Motion City soundtrack songs as well. So if people want to hear shitty versions of motion city soundtrack songs they're gonna they're gonna get them <laughs> uh, <laughs> is this a good sell i don't know it's, I it's, like it's, it's, like it's really weird it's almost as if you're you 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 got you somehow got a copy of my questions because everything was just like <laughs> there's three things that i have to ask you now well, look at that you just like you just go to tangent city I, and you like and you don't let up on the gas it's great well i i get nervous like i feel like i don't know I feel like I both say, I talk a lot, but I'm not sure I say anything. That's, that's my, you know, like in my head, that's what's going on. But if I keep talking, maybe something will happen. <laughs> that's my thought. Uh, if I keep yeah. talking, maybe sort of, something will happen, but just in yeah, the story. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of fueled by nervous energy, but I've learned to kind of funnel it in a positive direction. I think, I think. Do you speak with, uh, do you speak with Tony Jesse or Matt these days? I haven't, I'm trying to think, uh, we get like, there's like text threads. Somebody will send something stupid to each other. Um, so that's kind of how we mostly communicate. I really like, I don't know what the hell Matt is doing. I think he's in Portland. At one point I thought he was going to buy a van and like travel around the, the U S or something. I don't, I don't even know. He's living in Portland. That's all I know. Uh, I know Tony's still doing a lot of like comedy adjacent or related stuff and playing music. He's out in LA. Jesse, I think he's managing a bar in New Jersey. I think they moved, he and his wife and their kid, they moved to New Jersey. Um, yeah. And then Josh is here in Minneapolis. I see him, you know, obviously most of all. Um, but yeah, it's been fun to like become friends with Josh again. Cause we were really good friends and we started playing music together and then, we just didn't ever hang out because we always hung out. So that's been really nice. Um, yeah, so I guess the answer is not not really. But we're also a weird band where we never talk to each other outside of playing music together either. Or at least I didn't. Maybe I'm the one. Maybe I'm a horrible person. Uh, <laughs> I think Jesse, Jesse once said, like, hey, dude, in the eight years you lived at your old place, like, you never once invited me over. And I was like, oh, shit, is that... Is that something people do? I guess, like, okay. Um, but I, I just don't think about those things, which also gets me in trouble a lot in my regular married life is that I just don't think about things. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. Last question. Oh, oh really? We're already, I thought we were like halfway you. through. I told okay. you. I told. I told you. We're we're like we're we're, we're done. Just got yeah. one last thing. You, you've been knocking okay. them down before I can before I can say them. So sorry. Historically, you mm -hmm. don't like to speak after gigs because you're preserving your voice. There mm -hmm. is, it's something, or maybe that's what you say to people when you don't want to talk to them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I wish. And now you I have would. to do a ton of interviews to promote a record, and shows. Well, do I have to? I guess I don't have to do a ton of interviews. Uh, I'd be, I would be lucky if I could do some interviews. Um, but I think that I, I, I will just, you know what? And this is, this is maybe where therapy is helping a little bit because uh, I've been going to therapy for the last couple of years. And I think I'm getting better at the, the thing I'm working on is asking for what I want or need. And I always thought that was being selfish. But now I'm realizing that selfish isn't a negative thing. Selfish can be a good thing. And I was, uh, I guess that, that word kind of eluded me or it, it was very murky for years. And now I'm, I'm starting to understand the difference between good selfish and bad selfish. Um, and so I think I will just have more parameters, which is to say, I will only do interviews between such and such time. And like, I won't do this and I won't do that. And, you know, if people think I'm a big giant asshole, then I guess that's what I am. But really my focus is on giving the best performance I can because my voice is fucking shitty and it always goes out. So 
it, it, like it is a real thing and it infuriates me. I remember seeing Nate from uh, the format and fun, like before a show, like, I don't even think he smoked cigarettes, but I think he was smoking just to get his voice like all fucked up and like gargling whiskey and screaming just to like get his voice to sound shitty. And no matter what he did, it just sounded perfect. And I just hated him for that. Like it was so, so beautiful. Um, whereas I have the opposite thing. It's like, I drink nothing but water. I try to sleep eight to 10 hours a night. I don't talk to anyone and I still can't sing. So I don't know what it means, but I, I basically do whatever I can to just try to get through and, and give people a, a good show. And I, I think I found a way to do that with MCS in the later years where I was able to not lose my voice as much as I had in the earlier years. Um, but yeah, so that is a real thing and I will be doing it again on this. So as far as interviews go, I'll probably, I'll probably talk really quiet and I'll, uh, you know, do, do them between the hours of like three and, and six. I think you should just uh, hire four interns to transcribe every single word of this conversation that we're having and just slap that out oh, someplace man. for everybody to do it because I think we covered everything. Oh, yeah, I think we did too. It's nothing else, right? We're good? I think so. All right. <laughs> Although I, I feel that because the... we're recording this, we should have some sort of fabulous zinger to leave everybody on. Um, and I hadn't prepared for that, and neither did you, obviously, so I should probably think of... Oh, okay. I, I want, all right. Let me try this. Okay. Finish this sentence. Somebody else speaking. This is somebody else speaking, of course. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. I'd love to hang out with you tonight, but I'm going to go home, put on my copy of In the Drink, and... Masturbate. Why? No, that's just the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> I gotta go. Uh, it's been great talking with you.